So for the next part of our Free Thought Day, um, I'd like to introduce our next panel. So I want you to give me, um, come join me giving a warm welcome to the five wonderful authors and podcasters here to share their stories, and we're going to do a little Q&A afterwards. All right, so let's welcome Thomas Westbrook, Aaron Lewis, L.B. Sperling, Timothy Savage, and Don Lawson. Check, check. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Thomas Westbrook. I am a science communicator and I make animated videos on a channel called Holy Kool-Aid. I debunk pseudoscience for a living and at one point in my life I believed in extraterrestrial visitation, alien abduction, and of course, the government cover-up that's necessary for all of this to go unnoticed by the general public. You know, sheeple like you guys. I think all of us, it's safe to say, have believed in something at one point in time or another that is not factu factually accurate. I want to get a quick show of hands from you guys in the audience. Have you at any point in time, I'll just rapid fire through this, believed in psychics, miracles, the power of prayer, karma, that vaccines cause autism, that 9-11 was an inside job, in something like good luck, quantum new age spiritualism or whatever Deepak is calling it these days, <laughs> or any other form of pseudoscience that you've changed your mind on over the course of your life. I think it's safe to say that all of us have believed in something and then later found out that we were wrong. Now the problem with the alien story that I told you is that I believed in aliens First of all, for the wrong reasons, I fell down the YouTube rabbit hole and started watching all these conspiracy theory videos. A lot of them were just really, really bad CGI, and I'm sure you guys have all been to that part of the, the corner of weird YouTube before. But the way that I stopped believing in it was also for the wrong reasons. My college roommates came in and I was like, you guys have got to see this. Look, here's a video of an alien actually walking the streets of New York. They sat down, you know, already a little skeptical with the smirk on their face, only to laugh me out of the room when I showed them a clip that someone had pulled from the movie Signs. <laughs> now, I stopped believing in aliens, or at least I had a seed of skepticism about it, because I realized that I could be duped, and I realized that stuff on the internet is not always accurate. There's a lot of hoaxes out there. But I didn't stop believing in aliens because I learned how the world actually works, because I learned how to actually think critically and how to have logic and reason and skepticism in my life. And those are tools that I don't have enough time to get into today, but if you check out my channel, Holy Kool-Aid, I'll walk you through all the different ways that we can know how the universe works, that we can figure out scientifically. We can test and try and prove things and find out if something is true or if there's reason for doubt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Let's um, introduce Aaron. Just a little taller than me. Hi, my name is Aaron Lewis. I'm the author of Expose Yourself, How to Take Risks, Question Everything, and Find Yourself. This is my third book. My first two books were about my life and 20-year career as an exotic dancer. As an exotic dancer, you might imagine I ran across some awkward family conversations when my job came up, some judgment and stereotypes along with stigma and, you know, dirty looks. And I realized after becoming involved with the secular community that a lot of non-believers have gone through um, a lot of the things that I have. And so... Expose Yourself is about critical thinking from an unlikely voice of reason. Um, I go through how to take risks, how to question beliefs that you may have had, and how to expose yourself to the real world, and also expose your cognitive biases and things like that. And I do it through humor and funny stories about my career. If you can't laugh about shaking your butt on stage, what can you laugh about? So, Thank you, Erin. Also, be, um, check out her book. And we're going to have our next... Uh, there we go. <laughs> 
Hi, everybody. My name is LB. I'm best known for having spent 12 years illustrating the entire Bible in Lego. You can see it <laughs> over at this booth here. Um, <laughs> And you might wonder why an atheist would spend so long obsessed over illustrating the Bible. So let me tell you a bit about my story. I grew up religious, um, and my mom was a Sunday school teacher for a while. My family was religious. Um, but I really love the theme of uh, this year's Free Thought Day, which is Think Again. And when I was about 12 or 13 years old, uh, you know, my childhood was sort of coming to an end. I was uh, making the first steps toward adulthood. And this wasn't because someone had pushed me. I was, I was, you know, I didn't know any atheists or free thinkers. Um, I'm old enough that there was no internet to be connected with others who thought like me at the time. But just really on my own, I went through a phase of thinking again about uh, the superstitions that I had held on to, the magical thinking that went along, you know, as normal in childhood. But I wanted to kind of put that stuff away, separate make-believe from truth. And that was the process I went through to become an atheist. Um, it kind of made me more fascinated by religion than I had been. And I went on to study ancient Christianity and Judaism in college. And that's when I first read the Bible for myself. And when I was reading the Bible, I thought, geez, I don't think anybody actually, you know, everybody owns the Bible, but who actually reads this? Who knows all these you know, stories and teachings that are in here? It seems like nobody. So that's where I got the idea to try to make the Bible a little more approachable so that whether you're religious or not, you would actually read it. I think um, there have been a lot of great authors and speakers here who take on religion um, in a more directly confrontational way, and I think that's great, but I think there's some of us that uh, also want to approach things from a more subtle approach where that, that people who are religious will not just immediately shut down and circle the wagons to defend themselves against. And I think that's an important approach also because it will actually get religious people to pay attention. Thank you, Elvie. You can actually check out her canopy right over there on the right-hand side of the lawn. All right, Timothy? Hi there. I'm, I'm a little intimidated because I'm up here with so many astounding people and I am the most ordinary guy in the world, believe me. Um, with it, I'm a novelist. I write stories and I'd love a quick show of hands. How many people can recite, say, the most compelling logical argument and the philosopher for the non-existence of God? Let's see a show of hands. Not seeing any. How many people remember a good story? Everybody. That's why I like to write stories. Um, my novels feature characters who are openly godless and openly atheist, but they're confronting some very real moral dilemmas. These are people who have been hurt, who have been wounded, who are encountering injustice in their communities. And I tend to write about small communities because it's just a neat way to paint that picture. In one of my books, I have an atheist father who also happens to be a fugitive and he is living in hiding with his four-year-old autistic son who is incredibly curious about the world and wants to explore everything when a purported miracle occurs in Avila Beach where they're hiding, drawing all kinds of attention to that town. And this father has to figure out how can he continue to protect his son without resorting to religious means and without buying into that argument. My latest book was published about a month ago. It was called Lily Augustine. And it takes place in a very small town in Nebraska that is very firmly under the influence of a journalist who publishes a Catholic newspaper. And a great injustice has taken place in this town. My interloper appears, who is my main character and who is godless, and he's wondering why is no one helping the homeless woman in this community? How come everyone is shunning the person they call the town crazy? And is that really right or wrong? I think most of us could answer that question, but I try to do that in my book. Um, with it, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for everyone for coming and for being with us. Thanks. Thank you, Timothy. Before I introduce our next person, um, I want to remind everybody that we will have a Q&A after this, so if you'd like to line up um, right there at the microphone, feel free to do so. All right, Don Lawson. <laughs> I'm Don, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> My name is Don Lawson. I wrote How to Rob a Bank and Drag, which is kind of, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, 
I was strung out on heroin at one point. My partner was a bank robber, ex-bank robber, and we needed to pay for detoxes. And she told me if I go to prison, we'll be separated. I said, I'll rob banks with you. We'll go together. And I did that. And we did that. Uh, I wore high heels once as part of a disguise, and I don't walk well on heels. The FBI analyzed the tapes and said, aha, they're men dressing as women. So the FBI chased around the gang of drag queens for a really long time. I'm still trying to decide whether I should be offended over that, thinking that women can't rob banks. But uh, five years ago, a doctor told me I had less than a week to live. And all my life, people have been telling me I should write a book. I mean, I've written stories. I've written all my life. But when he told me I was going to die, I figured if I'm going to write that book, I better do it now. And I did. And I found out a lot of things. But when I said, Don, I'm, I'm Don, I'm an alcoholic, what happened to me, I got sober when I was 16 for the first time. In 12-step groups, there's a lot of pressure to find your higher power, which is a man. It can be anything you want. It can be a doorknob, but it's a man. And they say the Lord's Prayer after the meetings, and people tell you, you don't do this, you're going to drink, all that crap. 35 years, I chased a higher power around with a butterfly net. Finally had the long-awaited spiritual awakening and found out I was an atheist. And the gentleman that was talking about coming out it's like the gay thing a million years ago. A good friend told me she had slept with a woman, and I looked at her, I said, you can do that? And I realized I was in love with her, and people would say, you can't say things like that, and it's like, why not? The same thing has been true of atheism. I went straight to my A group and said, you know, it's like science is a blast. Atoms recycle. Who needs God? I mean, science is incredible. Uh, and I lost friends. Guess what? They weren't friends, you know? The people that love me, love me no matter what. One of my best friends is an Anglican priest. She loves science. And she doesn't care that I'm an atheist. She has not once prayed at me. I do have friends that say, I know you don't believe in God, but I prayed really, really hard, and I managed to get up this morning. Congratulations, you behave like a normal person. Uh, a lot of, I believe that a friend of mine says I worship nothing. I worship everything. I take in abandoned senior dogs. They've been through shit storms. She lived in a cage for nine years. Nobody touched her except to force her to breathe. When I got her, she looked like an ostrich dog. And these dogs slide into my soul and they light up things that I didn't know were there. They healed me. I had a shit storm of a life when I was a kid. My mom chased me out of the house with an axe when I was 14. Deeply religious woman. I, I, church was a party at the end of the week. I did catechism every day of the week. Nine years old, my pony died. I asked my priest how I'd find her. He said, you won't, you won't. animals don't have souls. I thought, you're an idiot. I had looked in her eyes. I had seen her soul. You know, whatever part isn't me, I don't know what you want to call that. I've said the word spirituality in a room full of atheists, and everybody's looked at me like somebody farted at the dinner table. Uh, I didn't let the Christians do it to me. I'm not letting the atheists do it to me. You know, when I lock eyes with a dog, something happens between the two of us, something important. And I think I'll finish with a line from Good Omens. Terry Pratchett is a god. If there is a god, he is one. Uh, there are a bunch of nuns, satanic nuns, that a demon kills once they've fulfilled their mission. One of them survives. Satan's turned on her. She can't be satanic any longer. Obviously, she's not into God. Uh, <laughs> my dog didn't take it up in my oxygen tube. We do this all day long. Uh, she, she realizes her job is being herself as hard as she can be. You know, it's like that thing right there is what writers can give people. You know, be yourself as hard as you can be. 
and I am really glad I was diagnosed as dead and got to come back from the dead because I didn't say a word the first 48 years of my life. Not a word. I was too depressed. You know, I, uh, when I discovered I was an atheist at the same time, it's like it freed me up. I can be myself as hard as I can be. Uh, my editor here is here. She was going to drive me, and she's texting me as I'm sitting there. I found a parking space for you. <laughs> she runs a little late sometimes. <laughs> you know, and I want to thank her. It's crucial to have a good ed editor, and she made that a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Oh, and I, as you were speaking, I, you said you were an exotic dancer. I told him she'd be really good at that. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you to our authors and podcasters. Um, so I'm going to open up the microphone for Q&A. So if anyone would like to start, I welcome you to go, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I have gotten introduced into the uh, atheist community because of videos like Thomas Westbrook and I'm sorry, Holy Cooler. Uh, and I was wondering if each and every one of you had a message that you wanted to make sure everybody took away from coming here. Because I know you all have excellent stories, but what is something we can do or action when we leave here from either hearing your story or for being better having come see you? Um, Holy Cooley is actually... This is actually Thomas. Do you want to go ahead and take that one? Sure. I, I would say it's at the end of every single one of my videos, you will hear me say, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. And I, I say that one, as a warning against cult-like uh, groups and organizations that will take advantage of you, that will tell you, oh, you just don't have an open mind and you need to be more open-minded. I'm like, yes, but we should also follow the skeptic maxim to keep an open mind but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> we need to know how the world actually works. We need to understand things. We need to be so curious from the, just the gut of our being, so curious that we go out and we discover things and we learn new things every single day. And until we learn how something works, don't hold a strong position on something that you know nothing about. Keep that curiosity alive, keep that spark burning, and always be willing to look a little deeper. With humility, we can discover how the world works. If we put those walls up and say we already know all the answers, we're not going to make any progress. Dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Thank you, Thomas. I have another take on that answer as well. I, I love the curiosity. It's something that has fed my life and something I've tried to teach my son ever since he came along. Uh, but I have a little different take on that, too. It's, it's what do you want somebody to take away? And a couple of years ago, um, as you know, we had this terrible shooting that took place in Las Vegas where a man got out in the corner of Mandalay Bay and busted out the window and started mowing people down. And as people do, I decided to post something on Facebook about that. And I got to thinking about how do we get over this? How do we get past it? And what I came up with and, and what I decided to share with the world was something like this. All the arguments I'm seeing in social media have to do with blame. It's like, well, this is obviously Obama's fault. No, it's Trump's fault. No, it's the gun nuts' fault. No, it's the liberals' fault. No, it's the evangelicals' fault. No, it's the atheists' fault. No to all of that. If we really want to make this world a better place, what we need to do is find that person over there or over there or over there. Get off our butt. Do something good for that person today. And then do it again tomorrow and then find another person and do that again the next day and do that every day until you die. And teach the same to your children and to your grandchildren. That is morality and that's how we get out of the mess that we're in today. You can apply that to anything. You can apply it to gun rules. You can apply it to abortion. You can apply it to freedom of religion. Why not just help that other person? Why not just do something good for them? You know, there are people in the world who believe that human morality comes from some external source. It's being broadcast from some sky ferry somewhere. No, that's not it. Human morality is based on two million years of human experience. We've developed it together. It's real. It does exist. And the best way to live it, in my opinion, 
is to go and do something good for some other person every day until you die. Thank you, Timothy. That was great. All right, do we have any more questions for the panel? Can I say something about of course. that? Yes. What he said and what he said. <laughs> <laughs> but insist on telling your truth. That is crucial. Don't let anybody else decide what your truth is. And the thing about morality, I, uh, I moderate a COPD site, and I'm trying to make people get their flu shots because most people get the flu, they're in bed for the week. We get the flu, we don't get back up. And you know the vaccine thing, every, you know. You turn my grandpa into a werewolf, I swear. Uh, somebody said herd immunity is the cornerstone of a healthy society, and that would be true for morality. You know, you pass it on a little bit, it keeps getting passed on. You know, people don't know what the hell to think of me at rehab because they're all Christian. I'm the one doing everything for everybody. And they're like, yeah, Dawn, she like does things. But, you know, it, it's like what you, I can't remember anybody's name, I'm sorry. If you don't have a dog, I can't remember your name. Uh, Pass it on. Tell your truth. Pass it on. It'll keep going and going and going. And sooner or later, people will realize the Bible is just batshit crazy. All of it. Even the Pope is saying the stories obviously aren't, we aren't true. They're allegorical. So it can mean anything to anybody. God did not call a do-over. Matthew 5 clearly states the Old Testament in its entirety is fully in effect. If you say different, you're guilty of hearsay. And that is batshit crazy. People are going to realize that someday and they're going to need something else to turn to. Let that be each other. Thank you. All right, looks like we have a few more minutes. Anybody else? Okay, I have a question, I guess, um, for anybody who'd like to answer. So what are your next steps for the next year or so? Are there any more brick Bible books or, <laughs> or any plans for um, future podcasts or books for anybody? Sure. My latest uh, Lego project is uh, the Brick Book of Mormon. The first few chapters of that are online. Um, I was not as familiar with uh, the teachings of the LDS Church um, as I was with uh, other forms of Christianity that I grew up with. But uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And um, if you look up the Brick Book, Brick Book of Mormon, uh, you'll, you'll be able to read that online. Uh, I did want to sort of answer the previous question, too, about what message that we want to get across and, and what I've been thinking about most recently. What concerns me most in this unprecedented time that we're living in is that we're facing a vicious war on truth that has jumped from the fringes of the alt-right, you know, uh, corners of the internet to the White House, and it's getting support from the entire Republican Party, where you know anything that is not favorable is declared false or fake, and it's it's an attempt to destroy the notion that there is some agreed upon, you know. The, there is some truth that we can all find through investigative means and agree upon. And I think that is really just kind of bedrock fundamental for a society to work. And that is under attack. And the forces are, that are doing it are doing it to undermine what is holding our society together. And it's a really scary time. And I am trying to think of ways. Uh, I mentioned in my last answer that, you know, it's sometimes taking a more subtle approach to combating religion is the right way. But I'm so concerned about this war on truth that I'm really, really trying to think of projects now that will take that on more forcefully, because I feel like in that regard, we're just running out of time. I should have should have brought my heels. I think maybe. <laughs> um, as far as any new projects that I have coming up, um, I've been kicking around the idea of another book, although that is still kind of formulating in my head. Um, 
to get back on the uh, the previous question asked as far as what um, I would like to see people take away from this event and other events like it is to normalize not believing um, what we grew up with and not believing in the dogma and to understand that there are a lot of people out there that are still pretending to believe because they're afraid of being rejected. Um, and I would like people to understand that there are so many of us and there are a lot of us that haven't actually spoken up about being atheist or agnostic or starting to question the morality of a God that would drown the whole world, uh, including all the animals. Um, and so I, I, would, I would like to people to have a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of knowing that it is okay to speak your truth and to be who you are and that we don't all have to believe in a magical sky fairy. We can, we can say that without, you know, getting kicked under the table from our stuffy relatives. So, What's your name? Karen. Karen. Thank you. Anybody else for Q&A? Uh, can I just speak on what Aaron said for just a second? The Bible study that you guys do uh, at the Naked Lounge, the first time my friend Matt and I went to that, I asked the barista if the atheists were here, there. And she pointed outside, she said, they're right out there. There were maybe eight people at a table. And we walked up, there was one chair. I sat down and a guy got up and got me at a chair. They were very friendly. And I said, you're the atheist, right? And they all looked at each other. And it was like, no, we could be. We haven't really thought about it. You know, it was, they were very open to being atheists. They had just never really thought about it. We found the real atheists, there were two of them. But the other guy, everybody else was looking at us like, what they're talking about is, has to be more interesting than what we're talking about. I would say read, read your ass off. Read, read, read. I am binge reading. I joined a group in Goodreads, somehow that turned into four groups in Goodreads, and I am just having a blast. Somebody asked me what I'm working on, I told them it's either speculative fiction or porn. Uh, I haven't decided which. Uh, but once I joined the speculative fiction group, I found out it can be both. Uh, so Alien Smut, I am having a blast with. Somebody wanted me to do a buddy read up on Marx, and I pondered it for a second. Of, nah, just read and keep reading and then read some more. Follow your curiosity. All right, looks like we have time for one more question. Go ahead, Alexis. Um, I would just like each person down the line maybe to say, what if there's someone here that is thinking of picking up a pen or thinking of picking up a mic to start a podcast? What advice would you give that person that's kind of nervous and doesn't know where to start? What helped you start to start the creative process? Great question. Thank you. I'm going to take a first stab at that one. Um, I, as an author, I've done seminars for other authors who want to get started. And there are really two keys, regardless of your topic, to being an author. One is called Dwick, and the other is called Bic. And actually, Bic comes before Dwick. And these are really simple to remember. Bic is butt in chair. You need to sit down and come up with a daily word count, a Dwick. Set a number. Write 700 words a day. At the end of the year, you're going to have a 50,000 word novel. It's going to need some editing, but you just need to sit down and do it. Don't have fear about sharing your truth, like Don was saying. Don't have fear about getting up there and being loud and telling your story, because we've all got them. Um, stories stick with people, much more so than logical arguments, or much more so than proof or evidence or anything like that today. If you happen to be working in such a political campaign, for example, the first thing they tell you to do is not memorize their list of talking points, it's come up with your personal story. Why is this important to you? Because sharing that personal story with people will get them on your side and will get them to feel something for you and not just think or agree with you. It's the feeling that drives people to do that. So I would encourage you, sit down, start writing it, tell your truth. You can do it. Thank you, how inspiring. Great. All right, another round of applause for our authors and podcasters. Thank you.